Hello, Insatiable listeners, Allie here. We are officially on hiatus in between season five and six, and we will return on Wednesday, November 21st with an incredible season. Many of these people have been on my bucket list to interview, and bam, they're coming on the show. (laughs) This episode will support you during the holidays and make sure you set yourself up the best way you can for 2019. And I can't even believe it's going to be 2019, but it's coming. In the meantime, enjoy these interviews where the tables were turned and I was the interviewee. I'm sure you'll get some more insights from these amazing interviewers and their great questions. Enjoy, and I will talk to you with live episodes on Wednesday, November 21st. So Money episode 293, Ali Shapiro. You're listening to So Money with award-winning money guru, Farnoosh Torabi. Each day, get a 30-minute dose of financial inspiration from the world's top business minds, authors, influencers, and from Farnoosh herself. Looking for ways to save on gas or double your double coupons? Sorry, you're in the wrong place. Seeking profound ways to live a richer, happier life? Welcome to So Money. Welcome back to So Money, everyone. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Farnoosh Tarabi. Well, ahead of introducing today's wonderful guest, I have to quickly share with you the charity fundraiser and competition that's going to be going on all month here at So Money, the entire month of November, in tandem with a charity fundraiser forward slash competition going on with Joe Saul Sihai's podcast, Stacking Benjamins. And to tell us all about that, I brought on Joe. And Joe, here you go. What, take the mic. You, you invited me onto this little fundraiser of yours. And I'm I'm excited, but also a little nervous. Farnish, I'm way excited that we're doing this together. You know, uh, we can raise a bunch of money for charity. And I love this at the end of the year with Thanksgiving. For people in the United States, we end the month of November with uh, Thanksgiving. And I thought, what a great way for our community to help another community that might need it. So we are going to be raising money for the Texas 4000, which is a 4,000 mile bike ride that University of Texas students take to raise money for cancer research and and cancer related causes. Uh, I know that they give a lot of money to MD Anderson Hospital, one of the premier uh, cancer treatment clinics in the United States in Houston, Texas. And then they also give it to worthwhile uh, research facilities around the nation. So we're going to be raising money at, at, at stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Texas 4000. And it's cool because our organization, Farnoosh, has a lot in terms of where the money goes, a lot in common with who mm-hmm. you're raising money yes. for. Talk about that for a minute. Well, thank you. That was a nice transition. So uh, I have chosen, our team here at So Money has chosen the largest student-run philanthropy in the world, near and dear to my heart as well, because I was a part of this when I was in college. It's the Penn State IFC Panhellenic Dance Marathon. It's affectionately known as THON, and it's a year-long effort to raise money and awareness for the fight against pediatric cancer. It's raised over over $125 million for the Four Diamonds Fund at Penn State Hershey Children's Hospital. And next year's THON 2016 is what we are fundraising for now. And that will be taking place February 19th through the 21st. It's a 46-hour dance marathon. I did it and I survived. It was uh, life-altering. But of course, it's for an amazing tremendous and important cause. Thon.org forward slash so money. Thon.org forward slash so money is where you can go to contribute. I know it's high season for canning and this is a way to join in on the fun. Anything you can do, know that it will be well spent. Over 95% of funds go to the families. That's so great. And the rider that we're riding for, uh, who's riding in the Texas 4000, her name is Shelby Schreiber. Her father was a single dad raising her Farnoosh. And when she was in high school, he started feeling bad, went to the doctor. It turned out he had terminal cancer and he passed away when she was just in high school. Mm. So here she is without a dad. And now she decided she's going to ride this 4,000 mile bike ride in honor of him. And they spend no money on the bike ride. Uh, All the food along the way, all the housing along the way is donated. So I love these organizations, but stackingbenjamins.com forward slash Texas four zero zero zero. And, and I hope together we can raise a lot of money. I think we will. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. 
Today's guest is a coach who helps people that are accomplished in life but battle with food. I think that's a lot of us. Ali Shapiro is here today, and she's coming to talk about her own innovative method that she developed called Truce with Food. It combines her background in functional medicine and holistic nutrition. She developed this while studying at the University of Pennsylvania. Ali also has a master's degree in coaching. Allie was inspired to help others after undergoing her own battle with teen cancer, which also affected her relationship with food. Now she runs an annual Truce with Food program while also working with clients one-on-one. Allie has had a lot of projects in the works, including the Truce with Food book and her own podcast, so stay tuned on that front. She's been featured in lots of major publications, including the Wall Street Journal, Huffington Post, Red Book, among countless others. Fun fact, Allie and I also went to college together, and here we are. Lots of takeaways from our interview, including Allie's new free program to help us with a health reboot after the holidays. I for sure will be signing up. The savvy business she ran from her home as a child, and how sticking to the basics of smart, healthy living has helped Allie save money as well. Here is Allie Shapiro. Ali Shapiro, welcome to So Money. You know, some people don't know, we actually went to college together. Nice to reconnect with you voice to voice. Yeah, you too, Fardish. It's funny how people come back into our lives. I know. Well, I'm really impressed with the career that you've established for yourself in the world of health and nutrition. And uh, I want to start by just first bragging a little bit about uh, your own innovative method that you developed called Truce with Food. Tell us a little bit about that. Why call it a truce with food? I guess I, I sense that we all have battles with food. Yeah, I love that you asked that question because a lot of times we we you know I hear my clients say, "Oh, I'm I've got to track my points or my calories. I'm just battling the scale." And we think that those are just words we're using, but they actually dictate how we think we have to approach um our health goals. And most of the language is about fighting your body and thinking that if you have cravings that you love food and 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 you know, you love it. And the reality is if you have cravings, you're not eating. The What's right wrong things. with you? How come you love food? Right, right. And oh, and a lot of people don't trust their bodies, right? If they've had health conditions or they can't lose weight, um, they really think their body is the enemy. And oftentimes, you know, to be at war with an enemy, you have to dehumanize it because we can't kill people we know. Uh, so we start <laughs> treating our bodies like they have no intelligence. There's something to be c- controlled. And we really just associate from them when the reality is to actually to actually feel great and have really wonderful health and lose weight, we actually have to partner with them. And so the truth is, how do you, you know, a lot of my clients know what they need to do, right? I know I need to stop eating sugar. I know I need more sleep. I I need to be more active, but how? It's all in the how. And so that's what a truce with food is really about. How do you actually learn what foods work best for you? And then how do you not stress eat? And how do you maintain the, your health as a priority amongst a thousand other competing commitments? And I would imagine it starts with changing some of that language and the stories that we tell ourselves around why certain certain things aren't working for us. And um, maybe it's even starting to appreciate food as opposed to feeling like it's the enemy. Totally. I always want my clients to like, I love food. And I'm like, no, I want you to love it in a healthy way, not a codependent way. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, tell us you have something really appropriate to offer people this month, which is that, you know, with the holidays coming around Thanksgiving and then the holidays in December, everybody tends to eat more than they were expecting or planning. Um, you have something for us. Tell us about it. Yeah. So, you know, arriving at a truce with food takes some time. So I always tell my clients come to me when they're done with magical thinking, <laughs> but they want magic. <laughs> and so one of the ways to get out of this all or nothing uh, mentality is practicing moderation amongst times that tend to be really overindulgent. And moderation is a lot easier than people think it is once they really understand how to eat you know, what people commonly refer to as clean eating. So I created a three-day plan just so that people can reset periodically from this time that has now started from Halloween through the new year so that they stop that 
you know, you kind of, you hit this point if you feel gross and then there's a no turning back and then the pressure to get back on track after New Year's builds and builds and builds and, and it detracts from the enjoyment of the holidays. So it's a three day reset of totally quick and easy recipes. I am not someone who cooks, I assemble. (laughs) And so I'm spilling all of my secret recipes that um, I use when I'm on the go, when I'm busy and you'll feel really full and you won't have cravings and you'll get a chance to um, avoid that that gross feeling tipping into the the hell with it or the F it, as some of yes. my clients say. <laughs> I mean, the way I think, I mean, it's so true. It's so psychological. You're like, well, I already overrated Thanksgiving. Christmas is only three more weeks or four more weeks. So what's the point of trying to lose the weight now? And I'm just going to like <laughs> do it all over again in a few weeks. Um, and I like what you said about I don't cook, I assemble. That's totally my life. Yeah. Yeah. And there's on the go options so that even if, you know, um, that are what well, I would call instant options mm. uh, so that you can, and I'm it'll include a shopping list. So you just take the list and go a couple hours of cooking. Um, and you don't have to do it all at once, but if you want to do, and it'll last three days. And if you don't even want to make all the recipes, there's uh, instant healthy choices in there as well. How do we get this? Yeah. So you can sign up on my list at AliShapiro.com or you can go directly to this site, um, which I think the link will be in the show notes, but it's AliShapiro.com backslash uh, clean eating reboot. Uh, and it'll, it'll come out on November 28th. And then you're also going to be invited to a, a Facebook group, but all of this is completely complimentary, uh, to ask any questions, get any support, uh, as we go through the holidays, because research shows us that when you have a partner, your rates, your success rates hmm. increases incrementally. It's the, it's the most amazing technology we have is group support. It's so true. It's true when it comes to money. It's true when it comes to health goals. So AliShapiro.com slash clean eating reboot. We'll put that over at somoneypodcast.com in the show notes. Now, let me ask you a personal question, Ali, because, you know, a lot of us arrive at our career destiny, not randomly, not just because we were inspired in a classroom. You were inspired in your life to pursue this path. Take us back to when you were not having a truce with food, when you were battling, what self-discoveries did you make that now play out big time in what you teach others? Yeah, this this career definitely found me. I mean, it didn't exist when we were in college. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it was about probably 12 or 13 years ago at this point, I was living in Philadelphia and I kept, uh, I thought I was eating healthy uh, and I was still gaining weight, even though I was overeating at times. Uh, and I went to my doctor or hoping that I had a thyroid issue, which looking back, thank God I didn't. But, you know, it's like, oh, maybe something's wrong with my thyroid. And while I was waiting for the doctor, I, I basically grabbed my health files, which I had never done before. <laughs> Even though they're your files, they feel like, oh, I can't, I can't look at them. At least I used to think that. And as I opened up the file, I just started looking back at my entire health history um, that was written there. And, you know, I really struggled with asthma as a kid, had been hospitalized for it. Then when I was 13, I, I was diagnosed with cancer. And so all the chemotherapy and radiation that I went through was there. And then I really struggled with acne and allergies, the Claritin D, all the antibiotics I tried, Accutane that I tried, um, and then the depression that I was struggling with in college. And then right, my first job out of college um, was a corporate job that was super stressful, traveling all over the world, exciting but stressful. And my health had taken a really big hit and I was diagnosed with irritable bowel syndrome. And I had this realization that, uh, wow, I don't have cancer, but I am not healthy And I had defined being healthy as not having cancer, which is a very narrow definition, right? And I, you know, my doctor came in, said my thyroid was fine. And she gave me a recipe that I I still remember. It was like salmon patties. And she told me to sprinkle Splenda on top of it. And having had cancer, I had done a ton of, I know, I had done a ton of research. Disgusting. I know. (laughs) Yeah. Not to mention the fact that it's disgusting, but I was just shocked because I was recommended. I had just moved to Philly that she was one of the best doctors. And I, because I had done so much research about the carcinogenic uh, foods, you know, once you have cancer, you become pretty vigilant. Um, and, well, in some ways you do. Um, and she gave me this and I was like, I knew that artificial sweeteners in independent research had been linked to, um, you know, potentially carcinogenic. And again, not, not one thing causes cancer, but I just walked out of there and I was like, 
wow, I am not going to get answers here. And I realized that I kept having these diagnoses and, and never really experiencing something where I wasn't trying on a medication or something. And it was, it was really like a dark night of the soul. And I always tell my clients, it was like, I realized I had to give up dieting. And I thought that that was resignation. I was like, Oh, you know, you always hear accept yourself. Um, but what, (laughs) as I stopped giving up dieting and this battling mentality, this whole new world, um, of functional medicine and holistic nutrition, I was finally open to it. And I started learning about gut health and blood sugar and started to connect how my asthma, my allergies, my acne, my irritable bowel syndrome and depression were all connected. And no one had ever told me this before. And looking back now, I realized that, you know, our medical system is sick care. And so you ask very different questions. You ask, how do we stop the bleeding? How do we just stop these symptoms? But functional medicine and wellness says, how do we make things better? How do we get to the root issue? And I really use the metaphor. I grew up as a tomboy, you know, how do we uh, play to win instead of just try not to lose? So being on the offensive instead of the defensive. And as I started to connect, especially with my gut health, that, you know, 95% of your serotonin is made in your gut, 70% of your immune system is there. So all of this acne and asthma um, was really a, a result of, a, of an impaired gut system. And so um, I started to heal my gut and and all of that stuff cleared up. And I couldn't believe it because I was like, I don't have a medical degree. Like, How was, quickly did it start to clear up? Yeah, great question. I mean, some of the immediate stuff like cravings and, um, and the heartburn that I was experiencing and the bloating cleared up within a couple of weeks. Um, but then, which is also what often happens with my clients is they're getting great results, they're feeling better, but then they have like, then they quote fall off the wagon again. And, um, so I had to really figure out why was I, why was I emotionally eating? Like why was, even though I knew I was feeling so much better, why was then I tr- eating to feel like crap? And there were, I put so much pressure on myself because I was like, Allie, you've, you've had cancer. You know how important this is. Why can't you, why can't you do this? You know what to do. And so that really led me to focusing on lifestyle changes. Um, and, as that started to happen, so I had lost about 10 pounds from, from healing my physiology, from, you know, clearing up my IBS and it was, weight loss was a side effect. So I was like, I'm going to keep going with this. Like what feels better now emotionally? And I remember like taking a lateral corporate job move, which at the time felt like, Oh, you're stepping off the track to success. But I just wanted to be able to walk to work because I was living in the city of Philadelphia and commuting to work. 50 minutes outside and I am a bad driver. I hated driving. And I was also traveling internationally for that job. And this new job, I would only be traveling to Delaware and South Jersey, you know, (laughs) a lot less glamorous than Paris and Madrid and London. But I was like, no, I want, I want to work in the city. I want my time back. Um, and so, and then, you know, I, I just started, I started dating. I didn't have a chance because I was always, um, I'm traveling and I felt like I had to wait to start dating until I lost weight. And then I met my now husband. And so I really focused on making my emotional life better. And that, that did take longer, but I got physical results pretty quickly. And the physical results continued to, um, exponentially increase as the emotional ones, uh, took and took, took into place. So I felt like I was going on an upward spiral staircase rather than a, a downward spiral. And your clients are largely professional women who seem to have it all together. They're the type A's. They are killing it at work. They've, they're, you know, they're strong women in many ways, but they are continuing to have this very big weakness, which is with, uh, with their relationship with food. Um, is that, uh, does that surprise you? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, I don't think that food issues is something that, um, is unique to any particular demographic. I think everybody has potentially, you know, their weaknesses when it comes to food and health and diet and physical fitness. But the professional women, I don't know, it's sort of like there's this resistance to let go sometimes. And that can really interfere with your ability to recover or win, as you say, instead of just avoiding, to, you know, not not losing. Yeah. And all Often all of that success, the career success, the juggling motherhood, the, the, you know, the being the good wife, the good partner, I, I, I coin, you know, emotional or battling food, like the good girl's disease, right? 
<laughs> you're not, you're not shoplifting. Like no one else is getting hurt here. <laughs> um, but often what's made them successful in those areas is actually throwing their body under the bus. I mean, I have a lot of clients who are, who are physicians and they're so successful because they work, they were, you know, especially medical school. It doesn't, you, 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 th- you can only pass <laughs> medical school if you throw your body under the bus. Um, and so what happens is there's, and, and there's a lot of research around this about basically the downside of a lot of self-control and willpower is that when you're with an area like money or food where you've been, where you've been in control in other areas, you start having the illusion of control. Um, and so you try the same tactics that worked for you in your career, um, in maintaining great relationships in motherhood. Um, and you think that that's going to be successful with, in this case, food. Um, but it's not, you have to learn a very new skill set. Um, it's, uh, you know, truce with food is that skill set. So it's, it's, it's a much more elegant process than I was. I went down a lot of bad roads, uh, or I should say dead ends, right? There's no such thing as failure, but it felt like a failure at the time. Um, so yeah, a lot of what's made people, uh, my clients successful elsewhere in their life is sabotaging them uh, with their health. But the great thing is it doesn't have to be an either or when you can right. get to those cold core stories, um, you start to be able to to have it all in a way, but what having it all means definitely changes. Mm. So let's radically shift things here for a second and talk about money. And, you know, I bring on guests to the show who aren't necessarily financial experts. They're not uh, in the world of, uh, you know, business, traditional business, but, you know, they're uh, online entrepreneurs, they're health coaches, they're authors, they're, um, you know, they run uh, various charities. So I think everybody has an interesting financial story. We've heard now your health story and curious to, to know now, Ali, you know, as someone who has really developed a very impressive business around um, health and healthy living, what is your money mantra? Do you have one? Yeah. Well, I, (laughs) simplicity, simplicity, simplicity (laughs) in life makes my money much more easier to, to be on top of. So visualize that for me. So you're saying that you uh, try to keep your life outside of money, very simple. How, and how does that ultimately mean that your money situation is simple? Yeah. So, well, I mean, yeah, I should backtrack because when you're running a business, I mean, you definitely have to have, um, (laughs) you know, a more complex understanding of money coming in and coming out because how you categorize things changes. But I would, so for example, with health, right. And, and I heard, you know, I just listened to your interview with Tara Gentile, which was great. Um, and she was talking about not doing the next big thing, right. In social media for, for your business, right. Like know what works for you. And in health, there are always these trends that are coming superfoods. Um, the big thing, right. You know, superfoods, uh, soul cycle, all these really trendy things and all those things can, can be helpful, but at its core, health is about getting eight hours of sleep, drinking water, eating mostly a plant-based diet. You don't need to be spending 30 bucks on superfoods. You don't need to be going on $400 detoxes. And so when you really understand that, a lot of what you think you need to purchase doesn't even happen. <laughs> like it doesn't need to, doesn't need to be ha- to happen. So you're saving a lot of money when you're just, <laughs> I'm writing that down, eight hours of sleep, water, and a plant-based diet. Yeah. <laughs> And it's you could so, probably shave 10% off your <laughs> your spending. Budget. Yeah, totally. And even cooking at home, assembling rather than thinking you have to even meal plan. You know, I tell my clients, you need to learn a couple basic assembling techniques and cooking techniques. And you don't even have to spend time meal planning because you can just improvise, which they actually find they love doing anyways. It becomes a creative outlet. They don't, it, there's no, all this excess energy around like going on Pinterest, looking at meals, you know, all that kind of stuff. And even at the grocery store, you start getting similar foods. You always have the same condiments in the refrigerator. So that kind of, that approach to life for me, just, it's also, you know, I'm a, I'm very like, I, I don't like to drive. Um, so, you know, I, then I don't have to worry about, you know, getting my oil changed and all that stuff. And I know not everyone can forego a car, but making decisions from a point on what's going to be the least maintenance and, and the things that I'll actually do and that I can integrate into my life, just make the amount that I spend go down dramatically. Um, 
and the energy involved in having to maintain all of those things um, are are much simpler. And and it's it's a really joyful life for me. What's one thing that you invest in health wise that um, is worth it? You know, it doesn't cost anything to sleep or drink water or, you know, eat kale necessarily. I mean, well, kale can be expensive, but (laughs) you know what I mean? It's a, (laughs) it's not soul cycle membership. Um, what do you, what do you invest in though? That's a little more, um, uh, that's an addition. That's a supplement. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if it would be, um, an addition or supplement, but I invest in, um, living somewhere that's walkable because, you know, all on the internet right now is sitting is the new smoking. And I, I know that and I still sit way too much. But for me, living in a walkable neighborhood completely dramatically, it's always more expensive, um, but it completely in a safe neighborhood, I should say, um, uh, it dramatically improves your health and well-being from not only are you more active during the day. Um, and you, your life is simpler, but you don't have the stress of a commute. You don't have the stress of time scarcity because everything is much more at your disposal. And so life is just so much simpler when you can live in a walkable neighborhood. And that's something that, you know, my husband and I, we, (laughs) we, as we've been moving around and trying to figure out where to like settle down, we were like, you know, are we really city people or convenience people and how much (laughs) walkability adds it, it adds so much more to our lives than we could ever, ever, ever quantify. Hmm. So you're living in Pittsburgh now, I know. And that's also where you grew up? It is. I know. I moved back after 18 mm-hmm. years. I never thought I'd come back. So share with me a little a little story about growing up in Pittsburgh and what Allie's experience to money was like as a kid. Do you have any pivotal memories? I I do. So I grew up, um, it, Pittsburgh is a very blue collar working town. My parents were city school teachers. We were very solidly middle class. And I, you know, I always wanted to work. Um, and I remember being, I think it was fifth grade in elementary school and this bank came and it was called Equibank. They don't, they no longer exist, but they said, if you invested $25 to open a checking account, they would give you $25. And this was like, what? You don't have to work for the money? Like you can just get it? And so I had first communion money and I went and opened up a checking account when I was in fifth grade and I like doubled my money, right? Pretty instantly. And so from that moment, I realized like how important, I think looking back, um, I always from that point wanted my own money because I felt like you had options when you did that. Um, and so, you know, even before you can work legally at 16, you can babysit. And my sister always jokes that I learned how to scale babysitting. <laughs> it wasn't the, the language that I used, but I had a lot of babysitting clients. And then I realized though that, you know, working, you know, with just babysitting one family, you, you cap out how much you can make. Cause there's a ton of babysitters in a suburban neighborhood, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's right. a, so I created this thing called kid camp. And in the summer, all of the kids would come to our place, uh, uh, the basement of my house, um, pay a lesser rate than they would if they had to pay an individual babysitter. And then all the kids got to play. I got to be creative and create out, you know, activities for them. And it was a huge success so much that we branched out to a Christmas slash holiday kid camp <laughs> that was all day. Wow. Yeah. We, yeah, we, we leveraged our, our brand, right? but were you I mean I wonder though like I guess you weren't teaching daycare it wasn't a daycare it was just sort of I mean because now I feel like you need you can't do that yeah it was it was but you know what it was like glorified Montessori school because we were doing crafts I didn't know how to teach kids the Montessori method but we were just we had different stations (laughs) and they would do crafts and we would it was a camp it it was a total camp and it was and you know talk about healthy just letting people play Um, and it was like three or four hours we'd give them a snack the parents came they loved it the kids got to see all their friends then they were exhausted afterwards so the there was a lot of value I mean I didn't know any of this at the time. I was just like, Ooh, you know, how can we do this? So Mm -hmm. I, I think, I I mean, I don't, I, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't something that I was like, Oh, this is happening. It's just, I wanted to be able to do health in a way that was integrity with uh, my experience and independent research. But I've always been entrepreneurial because I think I realized 
if you have money, you have options. And that money enabled me to go on vacations, um, you know, when I was in high school and pay for things that weren't really in our family's budget. I mean, I never went, I never went without, I, I felt like we, you know, were always okay, but I know thing I knew things were tight. Hmm. What would you say was your biggest failure financially? I had a lot in college. Did you, I don't know. Penn state was seemed to, I made some money and I spent a lot too in college. Yeah. So that's just my story though. I want to hear your story. Yeah. I feel like, cause I've listened to a, as, as I'm learning about money more and more, I've, I've, I'm listening to a lot of stories and my story was really the opposite. So I never had any debt, um, except for a mortgage, um, that, you know, when I bought my place at 26, but I think my biggest failure, or I would say lesson that I'm learning is when debt is good. You know, when you have your own business, um, you have to spend money to make money. And for several years, I mean, I invested in my, my graduate education because I knew that that would give my clients a better experience. It was a really safe financial investment to me, even though Penn is a fortune. <laughs> um, it was like, okay, I can do this. This is a long-term investment. But when you, when you grow your business, you know, I was always taught, ta- taught that debt was really bad and my parents never had a lot of debt. And what they were able to do on teacher salaries because they invested is miraculous. Um, so I always saw, saw debt as really, really bad. And these past couple of years, I'm realizing how much you can't do everything yourself. And if you don't take on smart debt, it doesn't mean you just spend to spend. Um, but that's never been my problem. I'm, I'm just very, again, simplistic, uh, that it can really re- give you a solid return on your investment. And that's, that's been what a really big and scary lesson for me. And when you, I agree, you have to spend money to make money. Sometimes you spend money and you don't make the money back. For sure. Well, and that's part of it, right? Like, and and this is part of my, my grudge with like the self-help industry is they're like, you have these self-limiting beliefs. And like, when I help my clients uncover their beliefs, I'm like, you know, this is hard because sometimes the belief is true, right? Sometimes you spend money and it doesn't give you a return on investment, but you have to learn to look at the the long term and not the short term and realize that it, a lot of making smart decisions is about context. And so you often have to go too far to know what is right. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's not that you're all, Trust me, I'm not out like, you know, <laughs> sending everyone money all of a sudden. Um, and there are certain places where I'm still like, I should have just paid to have someone else do that. And then there's other times where um, I'm like, oh, that probably wasn't, you know, like I am really big into when I do my programs, I want everything to look beautiful um, and your programs evolve. And in the early days, I spent so much money on graphic design of things that have changed. And I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have spent that. But now yeah. I know. Well, I think it was Ramit Sethi who was on my podcast and he's a friend and I don't know if he shared this on the episode, but he has he has publicly talked about, you know, how when you're starting a blog, it's not don't worry so much about the look. You know, like content drives people back and consistency drives people back. And then eventually once you have established your voice and you've got your audience and maybe some money, then you invest in making it beautiful and powerfully driven. But that if you're bootstrapping this in the beginning, spend less time on a graphic designer and more time on um, writing amazing content or in your case, developing courses or uh, finding clients. So, you know, if, if you have all the money, you can go ahead and do it. But if you have to choose kind of prioritize, it's really uh, not the, the top priority. What is your number one money habit, Ali? Something that you do habitually. I'm sure you have lots of healthy health habits. What about a financial habit? Yeah. And uh, I, w- so every month at the end of the month, um, you know, I do my expenses, I do my revenue. I see how much, I guess you would say, you know, um, the word that comes to mind is run rate, but like, okay, where am I financially? Um, all right, this, this goes here, this goes there. Um, and just always checking in. It's not sexy, (laughs) but it's just always making sure that I'm ahead of, of, um, or I'm either in line with what I've, what I've projected because, you know, projections, you can project things, but that's not always what happens. Um, so course correcting from that, that monthly, that end of the month, uh, type of, type of reconciliation, uh, with, with my business personally, again, I don't have to worry about it. Cause I, yeah, maybe I buy coffee out here and there, but that to me is like, fun and I'm not going to give that up. (laughs) Um, but I don't have a lot of out like major 
major personal expenses that I have to do that in my personal account. I, I always have extra money there. So it's really the business of tweaking because then I pay myself at the end of the month um, and course correctings. So just, again, the consistency of that. Great. I like paying yourself. Do it at the top of the month. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't wait till the end. <laughs> That's a good you lesson. See, first. I'm, I'm learning. I'm a newbie yeah. on this money thing. Um, let's do some so money fill in the blanks. I start a sentence and you finish it. Ready? Yeah. Okay. If I won the lottery tomorrow, let's say a hundred million bucks, the first thing I would do is. Yeah. I would go to a financial planner and figure out how much I need <laughs> to invest so I can live off the interest <laughs> and then find a way to, uh, to enjoy the rest, especially, uh, giving to a lot of causes that I care about and making sure my family's. Oh, and I would invest in my sister's business, hire an Esquire if they were. It's funny, you know, some people can't just like, they start with one thing. They're like, oh, and this, oh, and that thing too. Oh, and then I would do that. Oh, and then the charity. It's funny. I mean, it's gifts. It's a hundred million dollars a lot. So I guess I should ask, what are the first six things you would do? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Especially entre, you interview a lot of entrepreneurs. We have shiny object syndrome. Come on. (laughs) (laughs) Well, speaking of one thing that I spend my money on that makes my life easier or better is. Yeah, is I would say it's the walking, living in a walking neighborhood. (laughs) It's more, it's more, we're renting right now. Um, It costs more when I bought it my place, but it it just, to me, it's worth it. One thing that I splurge on, a little bit more, that you splurge on that uh, is a lot of money, but you wouldn't have it any other way is... Yeah. When I go out to eat, making sure we're really eating in healthy restaurants, we eat out, um, you know, three to four times a week, which is enough that um, I want it to be genuinely healthy. And because of government subsidies, healthy food is, costs more. Um, yeah. But I think it's a good ROI. So I don't even think about it because to me, your health is <laughs> your greatest wealth. It's number so, one. Yeah. One thing I wish I had learned about money growing up is? Yeah, this this idea of using other people's money to make you money. <laughs> That's so new to me. <laughs> Coaching, yeah. Um, and when I donate, I like to give to blank because? Mm, I love giving to um, health things that focus on prevention. Prevention is so much cheaper than uh, reaction. Mm. And last but not least, I'm Ali Shapiro. I'm so money because? I'm so money because, oh, I know because I don't play on women's insecurities around food and body, but I, I bet on their greatness. You bet on greatness. I love that. That's a totally first time ever on this show. And I, why it's why I invited you on because I knew you would be truly unique. Thank you so much, Ali Shapiro. Everyone, three day reset. I think this is going to appeal to a lot of people. I might be on that site um, come Thanksgiving, come Black Friday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's free, right? You don't even need a coupon. <laughs> yeah, totally. All right. Thanks so much, Allie. Have a great uh, holiday. Thank you, Farnoosh. It's been a pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about Allie, her website is AllieShapiro.com. She's also on Twitter at Allie M. Shapiro. You can check out this episode over at SoMoneyPodcast.com along with the transcript and comments from this interview and all previous interviews. And if you'd like to leave me a question, hop over to SoMoneyPodcast.com, click on Ask Farnoosh and ask away. Every Friday, I answer your money questions. Thanks again to my guest, Allie Shapiro. Thanks to you for listening. And I hope your day is so money. So Money. 